talking a little bit about the formation of elements, uh, which is the, the question or the question how the elements formed in an expanding universe is what led Gamow and Alpha to the prediction of the cosmic microwave background. And after that, so this was largely, I, I think I'll uh, review it just because it's interesting. It was largely forgotten and it would have been discovered just the same if this work had never happened, but it's still uh, still interesting. It's also fun to speculate why it was forgotten. But so then the uh, next thing I'll talk about is the discovery of the cosmic microwave background that everyone probably uh, has heard about by Penzias and Wilson in 1965. And uh, then as soon as it was discovered, if you look at the, the papers by the, or the paper by the Princeton group that came out at the same time as the paper by Penzias and Wilson, this was already called a, a black body or a cosmic uh, black body. So there was an assumption that this would be black body radiation, and so we'll discuss um, why there's a theoretical expecta expectation this, that this would be uh, black body radiation. And And then we'll discuss the, the measurements. Can everyone see okay? It looks a bit dark to me, but hopefully you can read it. Um, and then after discussing the black body radiation and the, the calculation, there's an obvious uh, additional prediction that uh, you get if you think that there's really a, a bath, a thermal bath of photons around because there's a, a preferred reference frame in which that gas or particles is at rest. So if uh, you're moving with respect to that frame, which is likely given that the Earth moves around the Sun and the Sun moves uh, in the galaxy, then you expect to see a kinematic dipole. So I'll discuss that and associated other additional effects And then from there, so this is the monopole, this is the dipole. It's natural to discuss uh, anisotropies that have to be there. So we'll discuss the primary anisotropies, the anisotropies that eventually, through gravitational interaction, grow into the stars and galaxies we see. So we'll discuss both the measurements and the theoretical calculation of the angular power spectrum. And uh, after that, so once we know how to calculate the power spectrum, we'll discuss a little bit how it's actually measured from the data. So I'll say a few words. Well, more than a few words, but I'll talk about CMB data analysis. And finally, I'll give an overview of, of current and future experiments. Ooh. And I'll also talk about the search for primordial gravitational waves in the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so that's roughly what I'm uh, hoping to cover. Uh, before we start, so I have a, a, an idea how to uh, to gauge it is maybe a quick poll. Uh, who of you have taken a class on general relativity? So that's pretty much everyone, which is good. <laughs> and then uh, who has taken a class on cosmology? Okay, that's essentially the same, same group of people. So we'll see. So I can keep the introduction short. 
Uh, I'll still give an introduction because some hands were down, but I'll, I'll keep it short. And if that's not long enough for those of you who haven't taken classes on them, you can just come after the lectures and ask me if you want to hear more about it. So um, the things I will review briefly Um, and I call it part one because eventually we'll need another piece. So part one is the, the homogeneous uh, cosmology. So I'll briefly talk about the FRW universe. So uh, general relativity, I think just to summarize, the, the basic idea is that you shouldn't think of gravity as a force that acts uh, on, on objects at a, at a distance, but you should think of it as uh, a force that arises uh, through the, the geometry. So the geometry of the matter distribution. So let me just say of, of matter. Obviously, there's additional interactions. It's just uh, the gravitational part is determined by the geometry and then the usual thing uh, for, the, for the matter interactions. And then uh, the geometry or the matter in turn determines what the geometry does. And if you haven't taken GR, this essentially uh, uh, is enough to, to follow uh, what, I'll, what I'll be saying. Uh, but we'll see a little bit more how that works at the level of, of equations. And so first, what we should define is what the, how we describe the geometry of space-time. In principle, there's various ways. But in, in physics, everyone follows what Riemann did. And we think of a, a spacetime as some manifold equipped with a, a metric. And if you have a, a coordinate system, so we have some, some coordinate system, some chart on our manifold, so we have some axis, then the metric is encoded by the line element. We have the S squared is G mu nu, which is a function of where you are on the, on the manifold, dx mu dx nu, and then uh, a simple example that everyone knows is Minkowski space, where the line element is just, let's write it as eta mu nu dx mu dx nu, which is, in my conventions, dt squared plus the x squared, which may be the opposite signature you used to from, from particle physics, but this is often the, the signature that's used in, in cosmology. Another example that I'm sure everyone is familiar with is the, the Schwarzschild metric. I won't, won't write it down. I'm sure you've seen it before. And then the one that we're using in, in cosmology is the, the metric that describes a homogeneous and isotropic universe. Now you might ask why are we using that metric? Why do we think the universe is described by a homogeneous and isotropic uh, metric? And the basic observation, if you look out at large-scale structure surveys or the cosmic microwave background, is that we see that the universe it looks isotropic, obviously not really isotropic in the sense that it looks the same in all directions, but statistically isotropic. And um, if we don't think that we live at the center of the universe, if we think that we don't live in a special place, then that would mean that the universe looks isotropic around every place, which then also means that it's homogeneous. And then you uniquely from these symmetries are led to the uh, Friedman, Lemaitre, Roberts, and Walker metric, which is given by, or well, has this line element. So you have minus dt squared plus a of t squared, and then there's dx squared plus k x dot dx squared divided by 1 
minus k x squared. And here, this thing is called the scale factor, just because it controls the scale of the spatial part of the metric. k can be 1, 0, or minus 1. If it's 1, it's called a closed universe. And you may recognize, it's not necessarily the standard way of writing the metric. It's one particular projection uh, for, the, for the three sphere, but it describes uh, the symmetric on a round three sphere. This one is a, a flat, called the flat universe. And this one is called an open universe. This one is in hyperbolic space. And this one is just Euclidean space. Uh, so these are the, the three options for the, for the FRW universe. And fortunately, or luckily, uh, all the data is consistent with the simplest version. It's consistent with just having k equals 0, which means life is relatively simple. Obviously, if you want to constrain the curvature, then you have to include it. But for most of what I'll be discussing, uh, I'll work with the flat FRW universe. And I should say, I didn't say it in the beginning, but if you have any questions, if you can't read anything, just, just let me know. Uh, it's also possible, given that for me right now it's 2 a.m., that I make a mistake somewhere. So also let me know if you think that I'm uh, just writing something that doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is, for the most part, the metric we'll, we'll be working with in the, in the first lecture. And... Uh, we'll now have to make the statement that the matter determines the, the geometry of space-time uh, a little bit more concrete and figure out what the equations of motion are for the, for the scale factor and for the matter distribution. And in practice, as you know, since you've uh, taken general relativity, this is uh, controlled by the field equations. Oh. Yeah. Well, at the roughly at the percent level. I mean, so here it's it's funny because it's written in a in a way that's discrete. But so you, you constrain this, and then there's uh, we'll see there's an energy density that you can write that has it goes like k over a squared. So there's some some piece that you can compare to energy densities. And it's, it's flat to within a, a percent, depending exactly on what data you use. I mean, maybe half a percent if you take a CMB plus uh, BAO data. So it's roughly at the percent level it's constrained. Okay, and so the field equations as you remember, look like this. So it's r mu nu minus one half g mu nu times r equals eight pi g t mu nu. Just for those who haven't taken uh, gr, let me give these things names. So this is the Ricci tensor. And I'll define it better in a second. This one is the Ricci scalar. And this is the stress energy tensor of the matter. And the Ricci tensor is equal to d gamma mu nu, which I'll also introduce in a second. These are the Christoffel symbols, x kappa minus d gamma mu kappa kappa 
px nu plus gamma mu nu kappa gamma kappa rho rho minus gamma mu kappa rho gamma rho kappa nu. The Ricci scalar is just the trace, so the Ricci scalar is g mu nu r mu nu and then I still have to define the Christoffel symbols the gammas and those are gamma mu nu rho is equal to one half g rho sigma and then d g mu sigma dx nu plus d g nu sigma dx mu minus d g mu nu by dx sigma. So this is what the equations look like. And so now we're trying to understand what they look like in the in cosmological setting in the FRW universe. And uh, relatively easy to work out. I won't really calculate them, but it's easy to see, for example, that gamma zero, zero, zero is equal to zero, uh, just because the, the metric that we had is uh, block diagonal. So if rho is equal to zero, then sigma has to be equal to zero. The others are also zero. So here you always end up taking a derivative of g zero, zero, which is just a constant. So this part vanishes. And then uh, we also right away know that these things all have to vanish because they violate the is uh, isotropy. So if any of them were non-zero, then you would have a, a preferred direction. So these have to all be zero. Obviously, you can also just uh, work out the explicit uh, expressions, but it turns out obviously it has to uh, come out this way. And the, the next one, if one of the indices up is i, then you have an option that one of them is uh, zero, the other one is j. They're symmetric, so this has to be the same as uh, zero j. And then for it to be rotational invariant, it has to be proportional to delta ij. And it turns out if you do the explicit calculation, it's a dot over a delta ij. So, so far, this is general. And then now I'll specialize to the, to the flat metric. It's also easy to write down the, the general versions. But the, the next ones, so if you have 0 up uh, and two spatial indices, then this one is a, a dot delta ij. Or you can write it as h times the spatial part gij of the, the metric. That's the, the general version. This one is the one that's true in the flat FRW metric. And then for the flat FRW metric also, uh, if you have three spatial indices, this is just equal to zero. If you're in the closed or open universe, then this is just the Christoffel symbol associated with this spatial part of the metric. So this is what they look like. So these, both of these are for k equals zero. And then given these, uh, it's straightforward to work out the the 0, 0, and ij component. Obviously, r 0, i again has to vanish because that would be a preferred direction, so we don't have to discuss that. But we'll need the r 0, 0 component. And if you look at r 0, 0, so if you have uh, mu and nu equals 0, then this term here just vanishes because you have two zeros on that Christoffel symbol. And with two zeros, it always vanishes, this one and this one. So you only get a contribution from, uh, from this guy. So you get a d by dt minus d by dt of 3 times h. That's the, the first piece. And then here, 0, 0, this one vanishes. And this one here, you just get uh, delta ij delta ji, which just gives you 3 times h squared. So you get minus 3 times h dot plus h squared. 
um, if you look at the, the spatial part, um, this is equal to, so here you get a contribution uh, from the ij part when this is equal to zero, so you get a d by dt, and we can write this as a squared delta ij times h. That's the, the contribution uh, from, from here. Then if you have ij, it vanishes, so there's no contribution from here. Then uh, from here, you get a contribution that's plus 3 a squared delta ij h squared, and then there's a contribution that's minus 2, because there's no, no trace in this thing. And so in summary, uh, if the derivative acts here, it cancels this guy. So what you have is just a squared delta ij times h dot plus 3h squared. That's the rij component. And then we can easily compute the Ricci scalar. So here we're just taking the trace. So we get minus this uh, plus 3 times this guy. So this is... Um, a, uh, this is, so the, from the trace, there's a 1 over a squared in the inverse of the metric, so this goes away. So we get a 6, and then h dot plus 2h squared. And from this, we can easily work out the components of the, the Einstein tensor, the combination on the left-hand side there, so we can work out G00, which is R00 minus one-half G00R, and this is equal to, so this is minus one, so these just cancel, so this is just R00 plus that thing, so you see that the, with the one-half, so the H dots cancel, and you're just left with a three H squared in this case, and then in the same way, gij is equal to rij minus one-half gijr. And uh, in this case, uh, again, this is just a squared delta ij, so you get the same thing as, uh, as here with a, with a minus sign, so you get minus a squared delta ij, and then there's a 2 h dot plus 3h squared. And so now we know the left-hand side of Einstein's equations. What we need to know is the, the right-hand side. And the stress tensor uh, also has to obey the, the same symmetries. Otherwise, you wouldn't get a, a solution. So you know that in the homogeneous isotropic universe, the stress tensor T mu nu has to be of a form where you have rho, which is just a function of T, and then on the diagonal is a squared p of t, so these are all just functions of t, not space, a squared p of t, a squared p of t, and the zero i components all have to vanish. And so now we can write down Einstein's equation, so I don't need this one anymore, so let's continue here. And so if we look at the 0, 0 component of Einstein's equations, we just get 3h squared is equal to 8 pi g t 0, 0. So this is 8 pi g times rho, which is called the, the Friedman equation. And then we can look at the ij component. And here we get minus, we can ignore the, oh, just cancel this on both sides. A squared delta ij appears here and also in the stress tensor. So we have minus uh, 2h dot plus 3h squared is equal to 8 pi g times p. And so we could be working with these equations. Usually what is done is to massage them slightly. So usually what one can do or what one does is to take the, the 0, 0 component take the time derivative, 
and then you see that this is uh, six from the two, so six h h dot is equal to eight pi g rho dot, and then you can multiply this one by h, so if we multiply the ij component by h, we just get minus two h h dot minus three, and let's call three h squared eight pi g times rho, from here, 8 pi g times rho times h is equal to 8 pi g times p times h. And so here, this is a, a third of this equation. Alternatively, we can multiply this thing by 3. So this is equivalently uh, rho dot plus 3h p plus rho is equal to zero. So this is the continuity equation. And this is usually what is used for the for the FRW universe. So usually what we use are the equations is the Friedman equation and the continuity equation. But you can also work with the other other equation if you want. It's useful for certain things. If you want to see what it takes for a universe to accelerate and so on, it's useful to write uh, other, uh, other versions. But usually you will write, well, let's write it as h squared is 8 pi g over 3 times rho, the Friedman equation, and then rho dot plus 3 h uh, rho plus p is equal zero, the continuity equation. So these are usually the equations that are used to, to describe an FRW universe. And um, so let's just do, let's do three examples, but let's do some simple examples, uh, how to solve them or where you can solve them. The first one is pressureless dust or dark matter. So here, the pressure is equal to zero. And really, we don't mean necessarily that the, the pressure is equal to zero, just that it's much smaller than the energy density. So if you have particles that are highly non-relativistic, then the pressure is of order the velocity dispersion, um, so of order v squared, whereas the, the energy of m times v squared, whereas the, the, ener the energy density is of order the, the mass. So it's down by a factor of v squared. So it's zero in, in that sense, not necessarily exactly zero. And in this case, if you look at the continuity equation, it just becomes rho dot plus 3h rho is equal to zero, which is easy to solve. Here, this just tells us that this is a dot over a, so this just tells us that rho scales like 1 over a cubed, or equivalently that we can write it as rho at some time 0, uh, a0 over a cubed. So that's what the energy density does. And then uh, we can work out what the, the time dependence of the scale factor is from the uh, Friedman equation. So we can uh, write. So here we have a dot over a squared, then is equal to 8 pi g over 3 times rho, which is rho naught a0 over a cubed. And the only thing that's uh, worth remembering of this is that it looks like a times a dot squared is equal to a constant, or equivalently a to the 1 half a dot is constant, or a to the 3 halves d by dt is a constant, which means that a to the 3 halves goes like t, or a goes like t to the 2 thirds, or if we want to write it out, we can write a of t is equal to the value at some time, uh, a0 times t over t0 
to the two thirds, and then let me squeeze it at the bottom. But if you calculate what h is for this, you just find that h is equal to two over three t in this case. So this is uh, what happens for uh, a matter dominated universe and we can do the same exercise for a radiation dominated universe. And for radiation or any, any type of massless particles, we have P equals one third rho. And in that case, Again, we just look at the continuity equation. One plus a third is four thirds, so this eventually becomes four times h times rho, which just means that rho is equal to rho naught times a naught over a to the fourth power. And um, we'll see in a second. So for the first part here, it's intuitively clear why the energy density should scale in this way. So this is just, let's say, dark matter. So we have a bunch of particles distributed in some volume. As the universe expands, if it grows by a factor of two in the linear direction, the number of particles in that volume stay the same, but the volume goes down by one over two cubed. So this is just the usual volume scaling. And uh, we'll see in a second why there's an additional power for the, uh, for, the massless, uh, for the massless stuff, for the radiation. And then from the Friedman equation, once you know that's what the energy density is, again, you have A dot over A squared is equal to eight pi G over three times rho naught A naught over A to the four. So you have A squared a dot squared is constant, or a a dot is equal to as uh, a, a constant, which means d by dt of a squared is a constant, which also means that a goes like the square root of t, or the way we wrote it earlier, a of t is a zero t over t zero to the one half and h goes like one over two t. So those are the uh, two examples that we'll also see later. So this is the radiation dominated universe. This is the, the matter dominated universe. And then in general, obviously we'll have a combination of things and often we assume that they're non-interacting so often we assume that we have some non-interacting mixture of, of different components. And for non-interacting mixture, so we'll assume that we have some, some matter which because they're not interacting, uh, it's the, its energy density is separately conserved or covariantly conserved. So here you have rho matter dot plus three H rho matter is equal to zero. Then for the radiation, again, if it's not interacting, if they're not exchanging energy, then uh, rho radiation dot plus oops, four H rho radiation is equal to zero. And then often we assume that there's also vacuum energy or dark energy, I mean, could be more general. So here I'm just writing the, the simplest version, rho vacuum dot is equal to zero. In general, we might be interested in a, an equation of state that's different from uh, minus one. So let me just write down the, the general uh, equation, let me call that one dark energy maybe, um, plus, and then there's 3H uh, times 1 plus W times rho dark energy is equal to zero, where sometimes this is called the equation of state. Uh, obviously, it's just a, a constant, but it appears in the equation of state where the pressure is equal to 
W times the, the energy density. So this is what the, uh, what the different components, the, what the continuity equation looks like for the different components. And then the uh, Friedman equation just takes the, the usual form. It's 8 pi g over 3, and then the, all the pieces appear separately. So we know what the solutions are for this equation. It's just that the energy density in the matter scale is like 1 over a cubed. So we can write this as rho matter at uh, 0 at the present time, for example, over a0 uh, times a0 over a cubed plus rho radiation at the present time, a0 over a to the fourth, and then plus rho vacuum if we just have uh, vacuum energy density. So this is what it would look like. And then to introduce some notation that you've probably also already seen, uh, let me slightly rewrite it. And let me write it as just saying that h squared is equal to h0 squared times omega matter a0 over a cubed plus omega radiation a0 over a to the fourth plus omega in the, well, usually it's called lambda, so maybe I should have called this lambda as well. Just cosmological constant instead of vacuum energy, you can put it on either side of the equation so you can think about it one way or the other. And here, the omegas, omega matter, for example, is the matter density today divided by the critical energy density, where the critical energy density, by definition, is just 3h0 squared over 8 pi g. So this is the, the various uh, definitions. And these just give you a fraction of the energy density stored in matter, a fraction of energy density stored in radiation, and a fraction of the energy density stored in the cosmological constant. Okay, so let's do one last thing with a general FRW metric and then look at the formation of elements. So the one thing we wanted to see is why there's a factor of uh, A0 over A to the fourth, so where the additional factor comes from, and this comes from the fact that the momenta redshift, so let's look at uh, particles in FRW. So in general, uh, FRW or not, uh, what you have is that particles are described by some world line action that you can write in this way, uh, integral over d tau minus g mu nu x dot mu x dot mu. And the equation of motion that you get from this, uh, from this action is the geodesic equation. And so we'll try to see what that means in, in the FRW universe. So let's look at the spatial components. So it's dx squared i d tau squared plus, and then here we have gamma i. If we have an index i here, one of the other guys has to be zero. The other one has to be another spatial index. And that's a factor of two because it could be j zero. So it's a factor of two dx zero d tau dxi d tau is equal to zero. And then notice that we can massage it uh, slightly by uh, writing d by d tau using the chain rule as d t by d tau d by d t and t is also the same as x0. So if you write the outer d by d tau in this way, 
this guy here cancels and the equation just becomes d by dt of dxi by d tau plus two, and this is just h delta ij, so h and then delta ij just means that this becomes dxi by d tau is equal to zero. And then from this equation, you see that dxi by d tau has to be proportional to one over a squared. And that means that the component of the momentum, so if you compute uh, the momentum, which is given by m d g i j d x i by d tau, then this goes like a squared, this goes like one over a squared. So this is just a constant. And if you then compute the magnitude of the three momentum, which is given by g i j p i p j, this goes like one over a squared. These are constants, so this goes like one over a. And so we can write the momentum of any, any given particle as the momentum at which, let's say, was produced or emitted. So it's the momentum at the time it was emitted times the scale factor when it was emitted divided by the scale factor. And this is often also written as the momentum when it was emitted times one plus the redshift at which it was emitted because you can think of this as saying it was produced at some time and then at some later time, the momentum is uh, changed by, by, this, by this factor. So the, the momentum of the particle is redshifted. And so far, this was for massive particles. I started with the action for massive particles. But this goes through in the same way for massless particles. And for massless particles, we also know that the energy is equal to the, to the magnitude of the momentum. And so that also means that the energy in a photon, let's say in an expanding universe, redshifts with one power of the scale factor. And this is why there's an additional uh, power of the scale factor appearing here in the, in the energy density. OK, so this is all I wanted to, to do for the, for the FRW universe. Uh, are there any, any questions about these parts? So most of you have seen these, so it's probably not too exciting. OK, so now with all this, we're ready to look at the, how the formation of elements works in this universe and follow along the, the logic that led Gamow and Alpha to the prediction that there should be a cosmic microwave background. So. we look at the formation of elements. And this goes back to a paper by Gamow in 1946. So here the question was, how in an expanding universe do the, uh, the elements form? The, and or put differently, um, Well, now let's just say how do elements form and uh, put differently, how long are the, the conditions in such a universe suitable for the, for the elements to form? And uh, to estimate that, what he did is a simple estimate. So what he knew from Hubble that the expansion rate of the universe today was something like 1 over 10 billion years. So it's 1 over 10 times 10 to the 9 years. 
this is 10 to the 10, a year is pi times 10 to the 7 seconds, so we have something like 1 over 3 times 10 to the 17 seconds, or something like 3 times 10 to the minus 18 hertz, so that's the, the expansion rate of the universe today, roughly. And then, assuming that the universe is filled with matter, you can extrapolate back and try to understand what was the expansion rate of the universe around the time elements formed. So that's the, the calculation he did, and we'll just do the, the estimate. So the way you would look at it is you want to understand how much the scale factor has to change for the energy densities to be of order nuclear densities of, or of order MeV to the 4. So we should understand what the, the energy densities are today. So today, from the Friedman equation, we just have that rho zero is of order 3 h zero squared over 8 pi g. And we can plug this, uh, this in. So we have something, and let's call this one m Planck squared. So there's 3 m Planck squared. And then here, uh, h zero squared is something like 10 to the minus 36 from, from the back times 9. Let's call that 10. So it's times 10 to the minus 35 uh, hertz squared. Uh, we can massage this a little bit. So this is, here we have a 3. Then M Planck is uh, defined in this way with the 8 pi is 2 times 10 to the 18 GeV. So this is 4 times 10 to the 36 GeV squared. You also know, let's put the 10 to the minus 35, but you also know that a hertz is uh, 10 to the minus 24 GeV. So this is 10 to the minus 48 GeV squared. So this, let's call it 10. So this is 10 to the minus 46. GeV to the fourth. We're more interested in MeV because we're interested in energy densities. Uh, this is a factor of 3 to the 4 times 12. So this is 10 to the 12 MeV to the fourth or 10 to the minus 34 MeV to the fourth. And if you assume that the universe is matter dominated, which is what Gamow assumed in, in his, I mean, this is what you assume if there's no cosmic microwave background or no radiation. So you assume that the universe is matter dominated, then the energy density at some other time should be rho zero times a zero, in particular, the energy density at the time uh, elements form, let's call it Big Bang nucleosynthesis, should be A zero over A BBN cubed. And so for this to be 1 MeV to the fourth, if this one is 10 to the minus 34 MeV to the fourth, this one has to be uh, 10 to the 34. Or put differently, let's continue on the other side, put differently, what we learn from these estimates is that A0 over A BBN should be around 10 to the 11, or equivalently that the redshift at which this happens should be around 10 to the 11. And what we were interested in really was what the expansion rate of the universe is, just to get an idea on what time scale the universe expands, how long there is for, for elements to form. And if you compute the, the Hubble rate, then uh, we know that this is, if it's matter dominated, it's just H0 times A0, so at BBN. So that H squared went like A over A0 cubed, so we're taking the square root, BBN. to the 3 halves. And so uh, here, so if we're taking the square of this, this is just the 10 to the 17. So here we have 
3 times 10 to the minus 18 hertz, and then here we have times 10 to the 17, so you have something like 0.3 hertz, so the, the time scale on which the universe uh, doubles in size is of order of few seconds. And so this is what led, so at the time the, the general idea or consensus was that there should be some equilibrium process that should be re uh, responsible for the formation of elements. And the fact that the universe was expanding relatively quickly was what led Gamow to the idea that maybe it wasn't really an equilibrium process, but maybe it's really an out of equilibrium process that leads to the formation of elements. And in particular, the idea that him and Alpha studied uh, was the idea that all the, all the elements form uh, through nu uh, neutron capture And this is a, it's a famous, uh, famous paper. It's the paper is often referred to as the alpha, beta, gamma paper. Because the first author, so this is alpha, beta, beta, and gamma. And, uh, my understanding is that Alpha was never too happy with this because it was a joke by Gamow. So Beta wasn't really involved in the paper. He just put him on there for, for this to work. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was on the thesis committee for Alpha. So Alpha was Gamow's graduate student. And he felt, I guess, that his credit, I mean, the credit was taken away from him by putting another uh, prominent physicist. But in any case, so this is the Alpha, Beta, uh, Alpha, Beta, Gamma paper. And the, the idea here was that the universe starts filled out entirely by neutrons. So you have a, a universe that's filled entirely by neutrons. As time goes on, uh, some of the neutrons decay into, into protons. So time goes on. and you end up with a universe that has neutrons and some protons, and some of these uh, protons capture neutrons to become deuterium, so the neutron uh, gets captured by the proton, so you're still left with a universe that has some deuterium, some neutrons, some protons, there's an ad additional neutron capture events, and the idea is that just all the, the elements are built up in this way, and so in terms of an equation, or a system of equations, in terms of a system of equations, what this would look like is that the co-moving density of the, of nucleus with uh, I uh, nucleons is equal to, so it increases whenever the nucleus with a number I minus one captures uh, an additional neutron. So if you have, uh, it looks like this, A cubed and I minus one times the neutron density times the thermally averaged uh, 
neutron capture cross-section for the nucleus with uh, A equals I minus 1 times V, and then it decreases if this nucleus uh, captures an additional neutron and makes the, the next guy, so it's A cubed Ni and N sigma IV, and you can rewrite that slightly, so you can rewrite that by introducing a new time dt, let's call it the number of neutrons times dt, so you just end up, and let's also right away call the co-moving density, let's call this one curly n, let's say, then what the equation looks like is just d by dt, d by d capital T now, of ni, the co-moving number density of nucleus with a equals i, is equal to, so this just becomes Ni minus 1. This is just the thermally averaged cross-section, I minus 1 times V minus Ni, and then the thermally averaged cross-section for neutron capture. So the equation looks like this, and you see that this only really depends on these uh, thermally averaged cross-sections, which were known. And eventually, the abundances depend on when you're looking, so at the, at the time at which you're looking at this. So it also depends on when you're looking. So here, by, when I say only, I mean the solution eventually only depends on, on these guys, the, the time and uh, the initial conditions. But initial conditions, for whatever reason, uh, they thought should be all neutrons. This way it goes through the literature for quite a while. It's clear that that's not really the right thing to do because you have processes uh, that, I mean, uh, weak interactions that convert neutrons into protons and so on that are efficient in the early universe. So that's not really the right initial conditions, but that's the initial conditions that they chose. If for any set of initial conditions, it really only depends eventually then on the, the cross sections and the and this time and so given that these are known and the abundances are measured what you can do is so this t let's write it out so let's say t1 minus t0 this is integral from t0 to t1 dt of the neutron density and so you can uh, measure this from from observation so you can just compare the observed uh, abundances of elements with this number. And I just have a slide to show you what that looks like. I mean, first I had a slide that has the, the original paper by, by Gamow, where he tells you, we see that the conditions ne necessary for rapid nuclear reactions were existing only for a very short time. This is what I said in the beginning. That's the famous paper from 1946. And then for the measurement, uh, this is the alpha, beta, gamma paper. This is the, the these are the measured abundances. And then this is the, the fit they were doing. So they're not really using the experimentally measured uh, cross sections, but some uh, interpolation, uh, some analytic uh, approximation. And they fit to, to the observed abundances to extract this number in this paper they got it wrong by 10 orders of magnitude <laughs> because of some numerical mistake. But Alf later fixed it in, a, in one of his papers and uh, uh, finds a number integral T0 to T1 dt for this quantity of something like 0 0.8 times 10 to the 18 seconds per cubic centimeter. So this comes directly from the, the abundance of the, of the elements. And so what you can do is this, this number, because neutrons decay, it, it's not really sensitive to, the, to T1. So you can take T1 uh, as large as you want. So you can take it to infinity, but you can use it 
to estimate when uh, nuclear synthesis should start. So you can use it to estimate the, the time t0 when it should start. And uh, the way you would do it is you just say, OK, we want integral t0 to infinity, let's say, times dt. If all you have are these, uh, the nucleons around, then the number density in the neutrons is of order the total energy density divided by the neutron mass times, because they're exponentially decaying, e to the minus t over tau, where this is the neutron lifetime. And this is the, the neutron mass. And then uh, by the Friedman equation, we can replace the, the energy density by 3h squared over 8 pi g. So we can write this as t0 to infinity. And then we have 3h squared over 8 pi g times the neutron mass times dt e to the minus t over tau. And we can massage this a little bit further because we know that in a matter-dominated universe, h goes like 2 over 3t, as we saw in the beginning. So this gives us a 4, which cancels this, becomes a 2. And then 1 over 3 squared is 9, so this is 1 over 6. So we can write this as integral dt from t0 to infinity of 1 over 6 pi g t squared times the neutron mass e to the minus t over tau with the neutron lifetime. And so if we rewrite it uh, by just rescaling the t by uh, the neutron lifetime, there's one here, one, two, two here. So we just get 1 over 6 pi g times the neutron mass times the neutron lifetime. And then a dimensionless integral, x0 to infinity, dx over x squared e to the minus x. And the problem is that if we estimate uh, this, this quantity here, it turns out that this number is much larger then the, well, let's still put it here maybe, but this number, if you estimate it, so this is 885 seconds, this is 1 GeV, this is uh, Planck squared, so eventually this thing is much bigger than the observed 0.8 times 10 to the 18 seconds per centimeter cubed. So to, to make this work, you would conclude that the integral of x naught should be large so that you're in the regime where the exponential is important. And that's a problem because if you look at what x naught was, x naught here was just t naught. So you need x naught much larger than 1, which means that t naught should be much bigger than the neutron lifetime, which doesn't make much sense because you're starting nuclear synthesis when all the, the neutrons have decayed. So you're not really able to generate a, a universe that looks like ours. And so there's a, a problem in, in this assumption that the universe is just filled with, with matter, just with nucleons. There's also one if you just go through and estimate the various rates and so on. But you can see it. This is the kind of logic that uh, was in these, uh, in these papers. And the solution they proposed was that, OK, maybe the simplest solution is that there is additional energy density. Because if you have additional energy density, then the neutron density isn't simply related to the energy density in this way, but it's much smaller than this. So there's some additional small number out here which then allows you to start nuclear synthesis before all the, the neutrons have decayed. So the, that's the solution and the solution that they propose. Does that make sense? So that's one of the basic conclusions of, of this paper. 
and the estimates they provided was, so you can estimate what the energy density should be to, to get this to work out. Today, the estimates were that the temperature of this radiation should be around five Kelvin. So this is the, the prediction from, this is a, a fairly large set of, of papers. So they were uh, writing a fair number of, of papers on, on these topics, but this is the, the prediction they came up with. Now, the problem with this is that the heavy elements can't really form in this way at all. So there's another conceptual issue with, the, with this idea because there are no stable nuclei for, with A equal five and eight. So you can't really make it through, so you can form the light elements this way, but you can't form the heavy elements this way. And in particular, then also the fit that was done that really determines the uh, neutron density times time in by fitting it to the abundance of, of heavy, uh, heavy elements also doesn't really make much sense because they presumably didn't form in this way. And this was also pointed out by Gamow. This was known at the, at the time. I mean, if you look at the years, it's not so surprising that people knew a lot about nuclear physics at the time. So uh, in 1948, uh, he points out that this doesn't work in this way. And he also points out that, well, uh, regardless of exactly how it happens, you have to form deuterium at some, at some point. For the formation of elements to work. And this will happen when the deuterium capture rates uh, are of order the expansion rate of the universe at the time. So H, again, uh, is, so now we're assuming that this is uh, radiation dominated, but it doesn't really matter much. This is either one over two T or two over three T. So what you conclude is that the N, N times T, similar quantity to the one we just estimated, has to be of order one over the neutron capture cross-section for a proton times the velocities. And then the neutron capture cross-section is something that was known at the time. So this is of order uh, around 4 times 10 to the minus 29 centimeters squared. And then the velocities, you also know because the, the energies or the kinetic energies are supposed to be of order MeV. The rest mass is of order GeV. So V squared should be 10 to the minus 3. So this should be 3 times 10 to the minus 2 times the speed of light. This is three times uh, 10 to the 10 in these units. So this is 10 to the nine centimeters per second. And so you conclude that, uh, well, an N times T should be one over four times 10 to the 20 seconds per cubic centimeter, or let's call it, so this is uh, 10 to the minus 20 uh, so this is of order 10 to the minus 20 uh, 10 to the 20, sorry, 10 
10 to the minus 20, so plus 20, and then divided by four, so let's call it 10 to the 19 uh, seconds per cubic centimeter, which is a similar number to, to this number, so the, the problem still persists. If you don't have any radiation, uh, nucleosynthesis still can't, uh, can't happen in this way, so even if this is how you're estimating it, you still need uh, uh, radiation. And once we know there is radiation, we can say a little bit more about how the elements actually form, even though it's not directly relevant for the cosmic microwave background. But in a radiation-dominated universe, nucleosynthesis takes place. when the photo dissociation of the So here there's the reaction where a proton and a neutron makes a deuteron emits a photon, so also if a photon hits a deuteron, you can uh, photo dissociate it and turn it back into a, a, fo a proton and a neutron. So in a universe where there's a lot of radiation around, it takes quite a while for, for deuterium abundance to be significant. Um, So nucleosynthesis happens when this uh, inverse process becomes inefficient enough so these reactions get going. So when uh, these two-body interactions where deuterium collides with the deuterium uh, helium-3, so this has two protons. So here we have another neutron. Here we have DD goes to tritium plus P. And then uh, these can rapidly convert plus proton or with another tritium plus neutron. So these are the, the interactions. You might ask why there aren't other interactions where the deuterium just interacts with so this is uh, quadratic in the density, so you see that this interaction is highly suppressed as long as the density of the uh, deuterium is low. You might ask why there aren't additional interactions where the deuterium just uh, interacts with a tritium or a, a helium-3 uh, and the, uh, uh, with another, sorry, with another proton uh, or neutron. And the problem is that those are electromagnetic interactions, so they're just suppressed because there's an electromagnetic coupling And these are all strong interactions. And these interactions are very efficient because helium is very stable and wanted to be in, in thermal equilibrium or in equilibrium for a long time, in existence for a long time. And so these are very efficient. And so essentially, <coughs> uh, so this happens very rapidly. So all neutrons present at this time, so when the uh, deuterium photo dissociation becomes inefficient and this starts, this is called the deuterium bottleneck because deuterium holds everyone up. So essentially all neutrons present at the time end up in, in helium. And um, so that means that if you compute the helium mass fraction, 
which is four times, just because it's four nucleons, the helium number density divided by the number density of, of protons plus four times the number density of uh, helium This is equal to, so here there's two neutrons, so this is twice the neutron density divided by the number density of, of total uh, nucleons. And it turns out, so I'm not really going to derive this part because it's mostly nucleosynthesis. The physics is very interesting. So first there's weak interactions that keep the neutrons and the protons in equilibrium and set some uh, equilibrium abundances between these two. Eventually those freeze out at a certain point in time. And then from then on, it's just the neutron decays that uh, set, the, set the abundances. So this becomes some times e to the minus t over tau to a good approximation. And it turns out that if one plugs in the numbers, the, the neutron lifetimes, uh, it's around uh, 0.24 for the, for the helium mass fraction. Is this uh, is the prediction of uh, light element formation. And all this, so this was, uh, uh, worked out early on, but was largely uh, forgotten. And I think the reason it was forgotten is that it turns out, I mean, you really find if you do these calculations that there were calculations done by uh, Fermi and, and Turkevich, for example, that this does this more carefully. So you see some of these interactions here in the, in the list uh, that I was just showing you. So here's, here's one of them, here's the other one. So there's uh, these uh, 28 interactions that they include uh, in their network. And it turns out that the, really you just don't make heavy elements in this way. So this just ends, you only produce the, the light elements. And uh, once you realize that the heavy elements didn't form in this way, I think it was fairly natural for people to assume, well, we don't understand how the heavy elements form in the stars, but obviously somehow they must form in the stars. And presumably then also the light elements form in the stars. There's not really an obvious reason to think that the light elements should form in this way. And it took quite a while, so until people realized that that couldn't really be true. So this was the work by Hoyle who worked on uh, uh, formation of elements in stars, and he explained that the nucleosynthesis in the in the stars it can explain the abundances of heavy elements, but it cannot really explain the abundances of of helium. So the stars would have to shine a lot brighter if they had produced all the, the helium in the in our universe. And so uh, from then on, it became clear that the heavy elements formed in the stars and the, the light elements, in particular helium, must have formed cosmologically in, in, in this way. And so that's the beginning of, of these calculations. Um, but the prediction of the CMB uh, was largely forgotten. And uh, people around the same time started to look for uh, black body radiation for different reasons. So the question that Dickey posed was just, uh, could a, a bounce uh, set up a, a fireball? So I guess in, in Princeton people, I, even at the time, liked the idea of a, a bouncing universe. So the question was, could a bounce set up a, a universe that's filled with hot and dense radiation that's left over and detectable today? And uh, Jim Peebles, if you look at his papers from the time, worked out all the theory of uh, nucleosynthesis, of uh, um, uh, recombination, and so on that's necessary for it. And Roll and Wilkinson uh, worked on the radiometer on top of the, the roof on the, the physics department and were trying to, to look for this radiation. And at the same time, there was another group uh, of people uh, that were hoping to measure something uh, completely different. So they were looking for uh, things completely unrelated to it and couldn't figure out why they had a noise in their instrument. You've probably heard the, the history, but here's the, the antenna. I, I didn't uh, include any, any slides, but the reason th there was this antenna is this is an antenna that's left over from a, a project called Project Echo by, by NASA, where the idea was you send up gigantic balloons and you try to send signals all the way across the US from California to uh, to New Jersey, this the thing stands in, in Homedale, New Jersey, and the 
the radio signal was sent from, from California and bounced off a big, big balloon. And obviously we don't use that technology anymore. We now use satellites, but that was why the telescope was there. And eventually after this experiment was done, it was made available to astrophysicists that could look at it. And Penzias and Wilson wanted to study things in the, in the galaxy and just couldn't get rid of the, some, some noise in the, in the background, in the, in the instrument that seemed to be coming from everywhere. They suspected that it would be pigeons, they cleaned it out, but eventually they heard uh, from, uh, from other people that there was a group in Princeton that was actually looking for such a signal that would be coming from everywhere. So they heard through different people. So there was uh, Bernie Burke, who was told by Ken Turner that there was a talk by Jim Peebles uh, that there was a group in, in Princeton that thought there should be this around and then they published their measurement of the excess antenna temperature at four gigahertz and right away the the group at Princeton interpreted this as, as cosmic black body radiation and we'll see uh, why that's the the expectation it's pretty bold so the the group in, in Princeton eventually provided their own measurement here's the the measurement uh, by by Penzias and Wilson and this is the measurement by the the Princeton group and uh, here, obviously, it had to be this uh, kind of shape. <laughs> but we'll see in the, in the next lecture why there's a, an expectation from a theoretical perspective that there should be this cosmic black body radiation. I mean, obviously, it's a little bit dangerous because other things emit, but it turns out the cosmic microwave uh, background at those frequencies is really very bright. Um, and so this, what they saw really was the, the cosmic microwave background. And so. Uh, I was told to end at uh, 45, so I'll basically end here, but the, uh, in the next uh, lecture we'll then study the, uh, why this looks like a black body and we'll also discuss to what extent or what the departures are from a, from a black body. Okay, any questions about...